this morning. Always an honor and a privilege to be able to bring a message to the people of God. We conclude this morning with the preaching series through the restoration plea. We talked about the fact that that great restoration movement of the 18th century and early 19th century here in America, of which we are the thankful descendants, had as one of its mottos that Christianity is about the fact that we have unity in faith, liberty in opinion, love in all. We've talked already about the unity in faith that God has given us in His Word everything we need to know in order to understand how we are to be saved. And that there is only one way, and it's only His way. And that we are united in His Word if we will submit to His Word. Because if we all come to the same text to understand the same God, we have the same understanding. As Paul wrote in Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, One God and Father has given us our one Lord, who was attested to by the one Spirit, who revealed to us the one faith, which teaches us about the one baptism, which places us within the one body, wherein lies man's one and only hope. We are united in the matters of faith. How one is to become a Christian, how one is to remain a Christian, how Christians are to worship their God. All united that we might be of one mind, right? 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, one mind speaking the same thing with the same judgment. Then we talked about the liberty we have in opinion. We talked about the fact that when we talk about opinion, we're not talking matters of faith. We're not talking about how does one become a Christian. We're talking about personal expressions of faith. In Romans 14, we talked about the fact that maybe the eating practices of some people. Maybe some people think not eating certain things, not eating certain things on a certain day, maybe they think that is something they do toward God. Well, there's nothing wrong with that if you keep that to yourself and, and don't place it on others. We talked about the expedience, that we have liberty in matter of expedience. Okay, we're going to pass these trays around, well, sort of, in a way, um, well, would there be anything wrong if we just said, um, why don't we just all come up one at a time and partake of it up here? No, it would kind of make sense to take the Lord's Supper on the Lord's table, right? What's the table there for? It's more of a, uh, those are matters of expedience. When do we meet for worship? Well, we're a scriptural congregation, so of course we assemble for worship at 10 a.m. Not like those 930 people, what is that about? Uh, half hours or um, there's nothing those are expedients and we have liberty with regards to opinions expedients and personal expressions of faith but love in all that's the topic this morning because that unity in faith we're going to see is by way of love how do we do it how was it offered to us how do we respond to it? How do we make it work? All these different people from different backgrounds. Love is the only way it works. What about that liberty of opinion? You know, I'm all, I'm all right with everybody's opinion as long as it agrees with mine because mine is right. And you're clearly wrong. Well, how do we get along with people with different opinions? Well, love is the answer. Because we're going to come to find out, hopefully you'll see, Christianity is all about love. It is love. Well, you talk about it all the time. Well, the reason I talk about it all the time is because it's in the Bible everywhere. And hopefully at the end of this morning's sermon, you'll understand love. And you'll understand how it underpins everything. And without it, it's in Christianity is impossible. Let us begin by talking about uh, yeah, that's not the, that's not the lesson. Uh, that's going to be more complicated, but that's fine. Uh, it may not even be there. It should be the, uh, oh yeah, it's up in the morning one. And its name is Sermon. There it is. <laughs> I thought that's what I was supposed to do. No, no, no. 
Uh, and we'll just have to do without. That's going to be First, first Thessalonians. It's all about love in all. And we have to understand love. Just go ahead and turn it off. Not, a, not an issue. Um, because our world, our country and culture, has perverted what love means. To be the love is just permissiveness. What Our accepting whatever somebody does, that's what love is. Well, that's not what love is. Uh, I have children. Um, and there are times I have shown them downright unfriendly behavior at times in love because they were acting in a way that was dangerous for them or would not be profitable for them in the future. Trying to raise children to be Christians. We're supposed to train them up in the admonition of the Lord. And what that does that entail? Well, the Bible says it entails the rod at times because spare the rod, spoil the child. Well, when I punished my children, was it because I did not love them? Quite the opposite. The reason I discipline my children is because I love them so much that I love them more than the inconvenience of having a child be angry with me. If I didn't do those things, that would be the proof I didn't love them. So what is love? Well, I think it's always good to consider what the Greek words for love. There are four main Greek words translated as love in the New Testament. And there's the word phileo. And phileo is that brotherly love, the, the love of friends. We have things in common. We like to do the same things. That's phileo. There is storge. Storge is familial love. I love my mama and I love my daddy. Why? Because they're my mama and they're my daddy. Okay? That's storge. There's eros. That's passionate love, the love between a husband and wife. And then there's agape love. And agape love is that godly love. Here's the difference between it and the other three. All of the other three are not chosen. I like people that like the same things that I do because those are the things I like. It's just what it is. It's natural. Storge, I love my family, but which one of us got to pick our family? None of us. It wasn't a choice. Passionate love. You, you could say that's a choice, but you're attracted to what you're attracted to. And what makes you passionate is what makes you passionate. Um, for any of those who might wish to know, uh, in my office on my desk is a thumb drive that has that file under it, but that's fine. <laughs> uh, but agape is a chosen love. It is purposeful. I have decided that I'm going to love somebody, and that's what agape love is. Okay? And when you put all of those together, I think one of the best definitions I've heard of what Christian love is about is seeking another person's good, even if it costs you. Seeking their good instead of your own. Turn to John, well, turn to John chapter 15, please. You remember in John 13, verse 1, one of my favorite verses, Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, and he knew what awaited him in Jerusalem. And yet, verse 1 of chapter 13 says, And loving his own, he loved them to the end. He knew what going to, it's under the file that says AA sermons. Um, he knew what was awaiting him in Jerusalem, and yet still he went. Loving his own, he loved them to the end. He knew what that would mean. Why did he go to Jerusalem? Why did he keep speaking? Why did he cleanse the temple? Why didn't he lay low? Because he loved them. And love seeks others good, even at our own cost. Look at chapter 15 of John, verses 14 and 15. Jesus, speaking to his disciples, said, You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called, I'm sorry, I missed it by one verse. Verse 13. Greater love, there you go, has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. There we are. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Jesus said the epitome of love was actually the giving of your life for them. So talk about seeking another's good even if it costs you yourself. 
look at Jesus. Jesus says, I love you this much that I'm going to lay down my life for you. And you are my servants if you do the same. Romans 15, verses 2 and 3. Let each of us, Paul wrote, please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. You see how it's spelled out there. Christian love is seeking what's best for others, even at our own. That's why we speak out to those who are walking in sin. That's why we speak out to those. We're supposed to warn those who are unruly, 1 Thessalonians 5. Why? Because we're hateful, mean-spirited, judgmental? No, because we love like our God loves, and he would seek that they be saved. And we can't help people be saved until they realize they have a problem. And then we can offer the solution. Love undergirds it all. That unity in faith. Without love, it is impossible for us to be united as a brotherhood with one faith. Because the faith is all about love. How are we even able to be saved? John 3.16. Because God loved us so much that he was going to give his son so that we could be saved. Well, what should that expression of love of God for us, what would it hope to accomplish? 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, the realizing that the faith teaches us that, a, that one died for all of us. Well, that should compel us to consider that one and to live for him, shouldn't it? God's love for us should re re uh, produce our love for him. 1 John 4 and verse 19, right? We love God. Why? Because we're so great in and of ourselves? No, because he loved us. And the natural response is to love him back. Again, what is the faith that we're supposed to be united in? Well, Jesus was asked this. He was asked, what is the one commandment? What's the first and foremost? And I always hear, if there's only one thing I do, what's the one thing I should do? And Jesus pulled a fast one, as he was uh, apt to do. He said, okay, here's the only one thing you should do. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Well, wait a minute. That's ever Yeah, see what he did there? He got you. And your neighbor as yourself. And notice what he said there at the end. On these two commandments, he was only asked for one. He gave him two. On these two commandments... Love God with all that you are. Love your neighbor as yourself. Hang all the law and the prophets. Did you hear what he just said? He says it's all about love. Everything else hangs on love. We talked about this, I believe, Wednesday. Look at the Ten Commandments. The first four are, God says, respect me as God and have no other. Why? Love me. What are the rest of the commandments? Honor your mother and father. AKA, love your, mother and, love your mother and father. Don't steal, love them. Don't lie, love them. Don't commit adultery, love one another. Don't envy one another, love one another. Upon this hang all the law and the prophets. John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. There's that unity in the faith. But I don't want to give up X, Y, Z. I don't want to go out and do uh, ABC. I'm not comfortable going out and talking to people about you, Jesus. I, that's just not my natural uh, mien. Well, God says, I want you to be like me. Do it for me. And we respond with love. It doesn't mean we all have to be preachers. What it means is we all need to know our word so that we can reach out with our life and with that word. We are united because of the love of God. We are saved because we return to that love of God. We reach out to others because of God's love for us and God's love for all. And then there's the shepherd's crook. Both ends of it, remember? Shepherd's crook's got one end, it's got a loop on it for pulling to the parakaleo. That's the Ephesians 4, 15 and 16. 
We're supposed to be speaking the truth in love. You can beat somebody up with the truth if you want. The Bible's a pretty good-sized book. You could give somebody a pretty good licking with it. But we're supposed to speak the truth in love so that they may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together unity of the faith by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying, the building up of itself, how? In love. Remember the other end of the shepherd's it's a hard, steel-tipped end, and it's to fend off. Well, 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26 says, A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. We're supposed to gently and lovingly go to those who have been ensnared by the devil with that crook. We're trying to bring them to us, lovingly and humbly. But if that doesn't work, we have the other verses. 1 Corinthians 5, 5a, 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 15, Matthew 18, 15 through 17, where we have to fend off. Why? Because we hate them? No. 2 Thessalonians spells it right out, not as an enemy, but as a brother, loving them that they might turn back. Unity in faith is only possible with love because love is the faith. And what unites us is that love. Wish we had a different word for love because you get tired of saying that same word, but it's what it means. Adoration. Liberty in opinion, in love. I could say lots of words here, but I'm just going to read Paul's because he said it exactly. Let each of us please his neighbor for his own good, leading to edification. Why? Because even Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, which unite us, might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, unity, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth, unity, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, summation statement, receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God remember the context this is after Romans 14 talking about matters of opinion matters of scruple matters of personal expression of faith what does he say receive one another we be brethren if there's a congregation somewhere that believes that it's more appropriate that they have one cup to partake of the Lord's Supper, but they don't bind it on anyone else. That's just their tradition, and that's what they want to do. We be brethren. Nothing wrong with that. Just that joke of James Meadows. I just want to be first. <laughs> then you can share the cup, but I'm first. Because <laughs> of hygiene. But we be brethren. That's why he said, therefore receive one another. Well, why would I do that? That's a silly thing to do. I don't agree with that, love. I don't agree with the times of service of the congregation here. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go along because of love. Well, I don't agree with, with this. I don't like the color of this carpet. It's just ridiculous. Well, love is what makes these things not matter. We have the things that we must stand upon, unity in the faith. Matters of opinion, yeah, that's fine with me. You guys don't want to have it 50 degrees? I think I'd be much more comfortable. 55? I'd be loving it. You might be a little cold. I'd be happy. So why am I sweating up here? Because I love you. And I'll do it. Well, take the suit off. Huh? But I love God, so I'm wearing the suit. So I'm wearing it. Love brings us together. And again, 
brethren, Christianity is love. There's no getting around it. And one of the biggest problems with our loving is that cost part, right? If Christian love is seeking other people's best, even if it costs you, we're just not willing to pay the cost. To love somebody, I have to make myself emotionally vulnerable. I have to open up myself. You know what one of the biggest issues now is? I don't wear watches, but it takes time to love somebody. Well, here's a guy on the side of the street, and he's got a sign, and he says, I need money, I can't, I don't have a place to live. Okay, I can open the window and I can give him a $5 bill, but I have no idea if I've done good or ill. What if he's a drug addict and I just gave him $5? All I did was help him in a downward spiral. That's not good. Why do those people do that so much? Because they count on people doing that instead of what would really be necessary. I need to pull my car over. I need to go talk to that individual and see what's going on in his life and see how I can really help him because what's the $5 going to do? I need to really get involved in his life and see how I can help him. But I got somewhere to be. I'm driving in my car, not just for fun. See, it's that time. That's what sometimes stops us from loving. Let's hang around after services and just talk to each other for hours and hours. Well, somebody's got to make lunch, and I, I got laundry to do, and I got to... No, there are things we're supposed to take care of, but love takes that investment, which is, like I said, sometimes makes you feel vulnerable because you reach out and go, hey, would you like to do something this way? No, no, thank you. Ow, Okay. That's fine. I don't mind. I hate that guy. You know, you know the, the opposite occurs. But it's hard to love because our world, what does our world teach us sadly? You've got to have your barriers up. and um, You've got to look out for number one. All these, this garbage that's so the opposite of love, that's what we have to overcome. Lower those barriers and be like Jesus. Think about our Lord. Think about how he interacted with every person he met. He landed the plane when it needed to be landed, and he reached out that hand and gave the hug. When One of the most beautiful scenes in the world is when Jesus reached out and healed that leper by touching him. Did Jesus have to touch the leper to heal him? No. Jesus healed people he didn't even see. When was the last time that leper was touched by somebody? You don't touch lepers. Unclean, unclean. It's beautiful. We have to be like that. Because that's what Christ-likeness, Christianity is. Galatians 5.14, remember what Jesus said in Matthew 22? He said, upon love hangs all the law and the prophets. Look what Paul wrote, Galatians 5.14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There it is again. That's the whole of Christianity. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. What's the foundation of that? Love. Would you like to be loved? Yes. Love others. Romans 5, 8 through 10. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more. Having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. There's the appeal. That's what God did. That's God's expression of love. That's God modeling it for us. And we're called to do the same. That's the whole of the law. Here are people, God says, who've rebelled against me. They will not allow me or acknowledge me as God. They will not obey me. They engage in wickedness all the time. They give the honor that's due to me, to other things, to people, to nothing. I'll send my son to die for them. And maybe they'll love me. Maybe they'll consider. That's the love we are to strive for. And it's daunting, brethren. Let's make it worth. Here's what Jesus said the standard of love was. Remember how he said, I don't have a new commandment? Remember John said, it's not a new commandment that I have. 
but a new commandment I have. And you're like, are, are you okay, John? You feeling all right? What, what are you doing? You just His point is the command to love has been from the beginning, but there's a newness to it. And here's the newness of the love in Christ. A new commandment, our Lord said, I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for another, one another. Jesus said that if we loved one another as he loved us, the whole world would know. I don't think the whole world knows. So where do you think the problem is? Do you think our Lord was a liar? I don't think so. I think the problem is with our loving one another as he loved us. Because it's such a daunting challenge to think of others more highly than myself, to give preference to others even if it costs me to lay down my life. That frightens me. And the only reason it frightens me is because I'm selfish. There's this guy in my brain called I, me. I've grown fond of him over the last 53 years. I like to do the things that please him, and yet Jesus caused me, calls me to deny him, and to take up a cross, an instrument of torturous death and to follow him, Luke 9, 23. And how does that mean? By loving everyone around us. That's why Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. Why? Because people don't love. You loving is like adding salt to something. It gives flavor to it. You're the light of the world. Why? Because people don't love. It's a world of darkness. It's self-service. But if you love, it'll shine and people will see it. Brethren, I'm telling you, the church is seen. I saw it in my, my father and, and stepmother um, became Christians once I had left. Uh, complicated. Uh, my mom and dad divorced when I was very young, and uh, he became a Christian when I was probably 15 years old. So I didn't visit dad as much then. Um, maybe once a month, and they became Christians, and I was into my high school stuff, and I was a busy football player and all this stuff. Um, but I did see he and my stepmother and their children, the way they interacted with one another, the way they loved one another, the way they were always together. Um, even later, when I was in college and afterwards, um, even when the kids were grown up, when they did vacations, they always went to be with their mom and dad. And I went, what's that about? Your mom and dad, why would you want to be with them? Because they adored each other. They loved one another. And it shone as light to me. And you can ask my wife, it was an attractive thing to see and to go be a part of. It was beautiful. And if we exhibit that love and that light, brethren, people will see it and people want it. As much as they may want to deny it, they want it. I, I think of Edwin Jones once saying, he did a sermon, and it was, may I have another one of those, please, is the name of the sermon. And it was all about that love. He says, if you're at a, a, a dinner somewhere, and this lady made the most incredible biscuits in the world, and he had one, and he was halfway through, and he went, ma'am, may I have another one of those, please? Why? Because that was fantastic, and I want one of those. If we love as Christ loves, brethren, the people will say that to us. I, I want what you have. I don't know what it is. But I want to know what it is, and I like being around it, salt and light. The question is, are we willing to pay that price? Because here it is. Jesus laid it out. Matthew 5, 43 through 48, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Uh, if you look in your Bibles, you'll find a very interesting thing. If you have a study Bible, um, all through the section where Jesus says, you have heard it said, there will be a notation of where that is found in the Old Testament because it was a commandment of the Old Testament. And here Jesus says, you have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor, and there's a reference to Leviticus 19.18, I think it is, and hate your enemy, and there's no reference because God never said that. That was man teaching. Jesus said, you've heard, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I'm telling you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. 
Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Brethren, that is no fun. I do not like that. These people are mean to me. They've hurt me. I want to see them get theirs. I would like to help them receive it. But that's all me. That's selfishness. That's me thinking of myself, making myself something great, that how dare they? How dare they treat me? How dare... Instead of looking through the eyes of my God and seeing here are people acting in this way, they're clearly not with God. They need and reaching out. But why should I do that, God? So that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. So that you can be like God. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? See, when we say love, sometimes we'll fall back into the worldly motto. Yeah, I love my brother. What does that mean? Well, I wish him well, I guess. What's he doing? Well, I have no idea. How's he doing? Well, I have no idea. When's the last time you did anything with outside of the service saying, good to see you? Well, I have no idea. How is that any different from the person that cuts their hair? Or the person they see at uh, the grocery store? It's not at all. So, so why do I have to go the, the next mile, God? Therefore you shall be perfect. Oh, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. It's because the standard is His. The standard is Him. Colossians 3.17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. It's an overarching principle that entails all of Christendom. Everything that you do, word, thought, deed, everything according to Jesus' authority, everything as Jesus would do it. You could say that this way, and in all that you do, love, like Jesus loved. What a challenge. 1 John 4 and verse 8, He who does not love does not know God, because God is what love is. That's the reality. And if you would be with God forever, you must be like God. To be with God there and then, you must be with God here and now. So what does that mean, if God is love? I must be love. People around me should epitomize me as love. What are you? What would the people around you say? I don't say this to put you down. I say this to challenge you to rise up, to love. We have the perfect example, and the only thing that keeps us from, us, keeps us from it is us, which is within our control. No one can stop us. That's another thing great about the agape love. It cannot be stopped. If I purpose to love you, nothing you do can stop me because I purpose it. Because God loves you, I will love you. And nothing can stop me. But he hates you. He says terrible things about you. But I'm going to love him because that's what my God would have me to do. There's the challenge. Get yourself out of the way. The biggest hindrance between Rick and in heaven is Rick. If I can get myself out of the way and just be walking with my God humbly, it is a walk in the park. If you're not a Christian this morning, sin is anything contrary to the will of God. It is any word, thought, or deed that God would not have contrary to his will. And that sin separates us from God. It's not his will. It's not like he says, I'm angry at you, get rid of, get lost. I don't want you around me. It's that our actions shove him away. Maybe better to say shove ourselves away from him. But he provided his son. 
his son on the cross as a means to reconcile, to forgive. If you've never taken him up on that offer, why not this morning? Why not begin that life? Think of the love of God for you. Doesn't he deserve your love? Christians, at one time in your life you said, yes, I will die to myself in the waters of baptism to live for you because of what you did for me in love. The question is, God hasn't changed, have you? Do you still love him like you did that day? Hopefully not, hopefully more. What about those around you? What about the family, the household of God? What about the people outside? What about the worst person you can think of? Are they at least in your prayers for the will of God in love? If that hasn't been your practice, make it so. Turn to God. Be like God. Be His. If there's anything we can do to help you in this, we'd ask that you come as together we stand and say. but the blood of Jesus.